If someone were to put the words PS2 and underrated in the same sentence, what PS2 games do you think of? If you just answered that out loud, then you're very silly. You see, the way this thing works is you can hear me, but I can't hear you. But for real, no matter how silly you may be, I do respect your opinion, and if you've got any suggestions for what you think are underrated PS2 games, then please do put them in the comments below. But I'm not having things getting silly. Here's mine. Now, for most of these, I'll do my best to only show footage from the beginning of the games. I'm gonna pretend like that's just to keep the video as spoiler-free for these 15 to 20-year-old games as I can, but really. I think maybe I'll just be a bit too lazy to play the games all the way through again. Too lazy to play video video games, what does that even mean? Driver Parallel Lines Honestly, Driver as a series is pretty underrated, from the first Driver game up to San Francisco. Except for you, Driv3R. How are you gonna poke fun at the fact that GTA's Tommy Versetti can't swim? Oh, I'm sorry, I meant Timmy Vermicelli. And then in your very next game have a protagonist who can't swim. Main protagonist needing armbands aside, this game is brilliant. But the problem it has is it has a reputation of being a GTA clone, which I can't even deny. It is. Here's where the game gets cool though. The game takes place in both 1978 and 2006. Now I was born in the mid 90s, so I wasn't around much for the 70s. I've also never been to New York. So it is with great confidence that I can say that the game does a great job of capturing the feel and the atmosphere of New York in the 70s and the 2000s. This game wasn't half-assed, or well, maybe apart from not being able to swim. But they even thought about the small things like the changes in the HUD when it goes from the 70s to the 2000s to give it a more modern feel. Well, modern for the time of its release, which was, by this point, almost 20 years ago. There's the obvious stuff too, like updating the weapons, the cars, the styles of the people in the street, the styles of the main character. Although, to be honest, modernizing all that kind of stuff is pretty much the bare minimum when you're doing a game with two different eras, but still pretty cool though, in my opinion. If it, I feel like if this game was released today, it would be released in two parts. You play as John Lennon, and your best friend is Jimi Hendrix. The first half of the game is a standard crime story. You're a bad boy doing bad things for bad people. Busting people out of prison, kidnapping others, and so on. But it takes a turn, and I don't want to give any spoilers, but there's a reason why the game jumps nearly 30 years, with the latter half of the game being a revenge story. It's like a modern age Red Dead Redemption. The Lord of the Rings trilogy is one of those trilogies that make you randomly at any point in the day just think to yourself. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. And whilst the two towers in Return of the King games also make you go. Lord of the Rings The Third Age, however, didn't seem to get that same appreciation, as far as I could tell anyway. So what does happen when Final Fantasy, one of the most well-regarded fantasy series in gaming, and Lord of the Rings, objectively the best fantasy films, it's not even subjective at this point. What happens when they meet? So the characters are likeable enough, but they do just feel like the creator said, what's the most basic traits of a Lord of the Rings characters, and give those basic traits to these characters. Whilst they're lacking the nuance and depth of the OG Fellowship, the fact that Lord of the Rings makes a big deal about elves and dwarves not being friends anymore because they had a bit of a falling out, so it's not common to see a dwarf, a human, and an elf all working together. But oh look, here's that exact same situation, which we also see in another game called War in the North. Not only are the characters just kind of recycled versions, of other characters. But they also took the easy route with the plot, which is also kind of just recycled. It starts off with you as Barathor, and your main task is to find Boromir. But after the multiple arrows incident, it basically turns into the characters, in Gandalf's size at least, being backup for Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, and all of those, in case anything goes wrong on their end. So that's why you're following them throughout all the incidents. It's easy, it's simple, it's not great, but it works well enough. If you frequently find yourself on Santa's naughty list, there's also a mode for you. It's called Evil... Evil Mode... Evil... And unless you play some of the battles as the baddies, Stuntman Ignition. Stuntman? Who's that? Like the world's worst superhero or something? <laughs> no, you idiot. It's a pretty simple premise. You are a stuntman, as you go through levels, completing as many objectives as you can to make sure the scene comes out as perfect as it could be. You have a director who I'm pretty sure is Alan Partridge. Cut! Rather good, actually. You're sure this is your first film? I think it's fair to say there's no level where you're gonna hit all the spots on the first try, but that, to me, that's where the fun is. Learning all the shots that you want and retrying the level until you get a perfect run is just... Mwah, something about it, so addictive. I do have one big gripe with this game though. Riding a bike in this is... it's not like riding a bike. It doesn't just all come back to you, it's just so bad. For a game where you need to be precise, and I mean real precise, because you'll hit a marker but the game is like... 
I don't know, you scraped a marker, I don't think it counts. You'd have thought they would have put a bit more effort into making the bike a bit more controllable, but it may actually be the worst bike gameplay I've ever played. Other than that, good game. Shadow of Rome. When we're talking about gory video games, even like almost 20 years later, I'd be hard pressed to find something as slicey and dicey as this. Not only do we have limbs flying around everywhere, but we can pick these limbs up to use as a weapon. This adds a whole new dynamic to the classic stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. His body's getting sliced cleanly in half. You see people trying to limp away or flail around on the ground as they wonder if they would actually ever get to meet Russell Crowe or if they've just been lied to. If I can be real for a second here, it's actually quite sickening. And I wouldn't actually be all too surprised if parents were putting in complaints because Russell Crowe doesn't even make a cameo. There is a setting where you can turn the gore off, but <laughs> let's be real, who's doing that? We appreciate your offer, but putting that in the game, waste of time. The game takes a surprising twist when you start playing as Raiden, doing these sneaking missions. I'm not entirely convinced it's a good twist, it's more like an ultimate nipple twist. Sure, under the right circumstances it's enjoyable, but most of the time it just leaves you wanting to go back to the other stuff. It's good for the plot of course, which at surface level is this. Agrippa has been thrown in to being a gladiator because his father was the man who was accused of assassinating Julius Caesar Salad. But Doc Octavianus, Caesar's nephew and Raiden's lookalike, doesn't believe him to be the culprit so he goes about trying to prove his innocence. I shall now announce the successor to the hero Julius Caesar. The man who shall ascend as the just ruler of our great nation. <sighs> Easy. Black. The PS2 was home to a lot of great FPS games. Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, Time Splitters, Killzone, Fashka... <laughs> One of those games isn't real. Can you guess which one? Pull an ambulance for me, please. All of these games are remembered fondly. Yes, even Fashka... <laughs> but it seems Black flew under the radar a little bit. Aside from having the basic aspects of what makes an FPS game good, the thing that made this one special was its level of destruction. I feel like by now, destructible buildings should be a standard in FPS games, but it's still not in a whole lot of them. Of course, with this game coming out all the way back in 2006, the level of destruction isn't amazing, but it was still good enough to the point where I didn't care about the objectives. I just wanted to go around seeing what I could blow up. That was back in 2006, so when I was around 10 years old, but now in 2024, as a 27 year old man, I couldn't care less about the objectives, I just had fun going around seeing what I could blow up. It's as simple as that. The graphics are also pretty crazy, when you reload your gun, the background blurs and it just really shows you all the details on the guns, it's insane. I had a lot of fun going back to this game and exploding those trucks and buildings, oh. Sometimes our needs are just so simple. Mark Echo's Getting Up Contents Under Pressure. This is probably the most dated game on this list. The beat em up gameplay isn't as good as I remember and a lot of that has to do with the camera work being pretty shoddy, but the story however still does and probably always will hold up. Some of the dark themes in this game might hit home for a lot of people as some of the story is really grounded in reality in a sort of scary sense for a lot of places in the world and even though I said it didn't age well it's a pretty mature game like Merlot levels of mature. So I might have you intrigued, what is this game about? Well it's all about waking up in the morning. Yeah we did it! We did it! We went for the low hanging fruit. The easy jokes, the obvious ones, we've only gone and done it. Okay, okay, so what is it actually all about? You play as a young graffiti artist called Train. He is not Thomas the Tank Engine's brother. But as a young graffiti artist living in a gentrified city, he's trying to climb the ranks to become a more renowned artist. But obviously I don't think you need me to tell you that. That's just the basics of it. As the game goes on and as the plot begins to unravel, it obviously becomes more than that. I don't want to ruin it by giving anything away. I know it's an old game, but spoilers do still exist. So whilst the game may not have been executed amazingly, okay. it's still a solid That's experience. Dark Cloud. This list was in no particular order, but I think for me this might be the main one that gets underappreciated. Just listen to this intro. This is a very simplistically complex game filled with mystique character and wonder. Wonder, ring, why more people didn't appreciate this. 
It was slated at the time to be a Zelda ripoff, and I can only assume that Sony was trying to capitalise on the success of Zelda, which unfortunately gave the game a bit of a reputation. The inspiration is clear to see, even the silent protagonist's tone is almost a direct rip of Link. But there was also a lot of love and care put into this game. The game starts with a genie getting released because this dude from Wacky Races, cosplaying as a Monty Python colonel, thought it'd be a good idea to release this genie. He's actually a big bad meanie genie who destroys tons of towns and I think his end goal is to destroy the world. It's pretty original stuff. This old man who is actually a big old fairy makes a powerpoint presentation to explain all this to you and it is now your quest to rebuild all these villages. If you're anything like me you might like the idea of games where you can build cities but then you realise it might just become a bit too time consuming. The good news for this game is you're rebuilding villages at the most simplistic level. People do have specific requests like put me next to the shop because even though there's two things to do around here, I can't be asked traveling an extra minute to a shop. That's what it is, some people want to be close to the shop, some people want to be next to a pond, just all these little, little kinks to figure out. I believe there's six villages in total, but I'm only going to show you the first one as an example. You should go from something like this, to this. The other side of the game is a dungeon crawler, and that's so you can get all the items and buildings that you need to rebuild the villages. It's not a perfect game, it's got some great ideas that are executed in basic ways, but that to me is honestly why it's good. It's got enough air to keep you going to the end, it doesn't overwhelm you so you can chill with it after a long work day, and the music is great too. I mean for myself, it's not much more I could want. I do wonder how far the playtest has got though, because this glitch is very early on in the game, and it happens every single time. But to me, the game just wouldn't be the same without it. Ultimate Spider-Man. Look, the clues in the name. Ultimate Spider-Man. It's the ultimate one. Although Spider-Man 2 on the PS2 is actually a better game. That doesn't mean this one's not good. I believe the art style is taken from the animated series of the Ultimate Spider-Man, which gives it a much more cartoony look, which is kind of cool. I kind of like it. You do all your classic Spider-Man stuff, swinging around the city, punching 50-year-old kids. But the thing that sold me on this game was you get to play as Venom. Venom had a hold on me when I was younger, for no other simple fact than I thought that he looked cool. So getting to play as that alien freak and scar children for life was just the purple coloured cherry on top of an already good game. Okay, just for future reference, I'm going to try and refrain from talking about Venom's purple cherry. 13. The PS2 was home to a lot of great FPS games. I think I just had deja vu. Hey, speaking of deja vu, in this game you play as a man who has amnesia, which has nothing to do with deja vu. So, let me start again. Hey, speaking of deja vu, in this game you play as a man with amnesia. Oh. I see what's happening here. Playing this game is like playing an FPS cartoon of the Bourne series. You wake up on a beach after getting shot and the only thing you remember is getting shot. So it starts off with you trying to find out who you are, what you've done, what you need to do. The whole aesthetic of this game is absolutely great. I love the cartoon panels that appear when you get a headshot or if someone falls off somewhere or something like that. And it just has such a great eerie opening. When I was younger, the part where this happens really freaked me out and it stayed with me. What an amazing way to start a game. They did make a remake a few years ago, but I've never played it, only because I've heard such bad things about it, so if you can, it seems like the best version to play is just this classic version. This next game is a 3D platformer where you play as a treasure-obsessed adventurer with short brown spiky hair. You get separated from your potential love interest, a blonde-haired woman, after a plane crash. Which, by the way, you also have a friend with a mustache and also knows how to fly a plane. You land in this beautiful jungle and you have to do a lot of running, jumping and climbing to rescue the people you've separated from, whilst also trying to find the lost city of El Dorado before the bad guys do. It all sounds very familiar. The gameplay is your standard 2000s platformer, but it is hella fun and worth a shot. I never managed to complete this game though because it was actually a game that my uncle owned, so I only ever played it at his, and he lived like 700 miles away. He was actually the one who reminded me of this game's existence. It's a game called Pitfall Lost Expedition. Peter Jackson's King Kong's Big Day Out. I will in fact be spoiling this one. It may not be as good as the King Kong that came out last year, but this may be one of the most immersive games I've ever played. It stays pretty true to the movie that it's based on, which in my opinion is a pretty important movie, because it taught us... Tortoise. It's not about a tortoise, it's about a big ape. It taught us that women can indeed love big hairy apes. 
Film Australia. I'm pretty sure that's a message the film is trying to convey. It's been a while since I've seen it, to be honest. But of course, I do remember off by heart, word for word, the famous quote at the end of the movie. It wasn't love that killed him. It was the beauty and the beast. Now I just hope they don't let Anne get a job at the zoo. I'm gonna need a big HR department for that one. Whoever had the idea to not include a HUD vote, give that person a raise. It may be almost 20 years too late, in fact they may even be dead by now. But in that case, give him a different kind of raise. Raise him from the dead, get him to work on some new games. No rest for the game makers, I always say. And so does the industry. Crunch is a serious thing and it shouldn't be joked about. I'm getting pretty off track. Hey, what's this video about again? Not about Crunch. Okay. Underrated PS2 games. Alright, okay. If you saw my 50 PSP games video, you may have seen the PSP version of this game on that list, and we found out that the title of the game is longer than the game itself. Luckily, this PS2 version is actually longer, and it's not as isolating. There's actually other people in this one, and even Jack Black himself. There is some absolutely beautiful cinematic camera work in this game. Oh, and hey, look! At the end of the game, it turns into Ape Escape. Gameplay-wise, this game is still one of the most atmospheric FPS games I've ever played. But they also managed to absolutely nail playing as King Kong. Ho <laughs> ho ho! This Kong ain't so diddy. God damn, what's he doing that big old dumpy? That's an ass of a king. A King Kong. Wait. Another word for donkey is ass. The ass has been right under our noses the whole time. This is Donkey Kang, or Donkey Kong. Heroes of Might and Magic and the quest for the Bone Staff. Dragons. You fancy yourself a dragon slayer, you. What do you think? This game is like if Mountain Blade, because of the whole going around the map recruiting an army aspect, Skyrim, because there's swords, and Super Mario, because there's castles, had a threesome. I feel like this game is what would come of that. This is a tricky one because I feel it's actually been rated pretty fairly. I'm aware of its flaws and shortcomings, but I still enjoy it for what it is. And what it is, is a remake of a very old game called King's Quest. The game doesn't hold your hand at all, in fact it just throws you in and says do your thing. Your objective is to get the Dragonbone Staff because this king swallowed some poison. What a silly man. And the staff would apparently help this. The gameplay is supposed to be an RTS, but it's kind of stripped to just the socks of an RTS. So don't expect too much, but you can still expect a pretty good time. Now I would just like to end this video mentioning two racing games. There's not too much to say about them, but I still feel like they were underrated. One of them is Destruction Derby Arenas. When the first two games came out on the PS1 and were highly regarded, I feel like when Arenas came out on the PS2 it didn't get that same sort of respect. And I feel like a lot of that is a change in style. While the first two I think were trying to be a bit more realistic, Arenas just went all out on the whole arcadey sort of style. But it's still good, the races are fun in their own right, but that's not what we're here for. No, we're here for the big bowls. Just these arenas that you go into to crash into everyone. That's all there is to it. Crash, crash, crash. And if you don't think that sounds like a good time, then I'll crash into you if you're not careful. Okay, sorry. I didn't really mean that. I love you. The other one is a game called Crash and Burn. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it's a game where you crash and you, well, you get hurt. You can upgrade and customize your car and there's actually a fair amount of options. It's just a neat little racing game. Honestly, there's not too much to say about it. So there they are. It may not be every PS2 game, but I feel it's underrated. But that is the gist of it. So of course, feel free to express your opinion in the comments below whether you feel like some of these games aren't underrated and I could be wrong. They might have like a massive following that I just don't know about. You also probably have some games that you feel like were underappreciated on the PlayStation 2. So if you want to, then share all your opinions down below. And hopefully I'll catch you later. Bye! <laughs> Whoa! I can't believe I almost forgot. True Crime Streets of LA because something about this is hilarious to me. I've yet to play another game where a gang of homeless men were just laying into me, ninja kicking me, hit me with bottles. I just couldn't escape and I'm not sure if that's because of the gameplay or if it's just because I was laughing too hard.